Today's video is another compilation of some of the worst mountaineering tragedies we have covered on this channel. From the worst California accident of 2024 to the 2024 Denali deaths, a famous Russian climber's attempt at a new route on Gasherbrum 4, and lastly, to the overcrowding on Everest. We cover it all. I appreciate everyone taking the time to watch my marathon videos, but if you want to see news stories as they get posted, just hit the subscribe button. And remember, viewer discretion is advised. On May 7, 2024, Ethan Cannert stood at the bottom of the final 400, one of the steepest and deadliest areas on Mount Whitney. He had been waiting for hours for two other climbers who had summited the peak with him just earlier that day, but he was beginning to feel worried, as they should have reached him by now. Eventually, Ethan would have to abandon their meeting point and ascend the mountain to call for help. Mount Whitney is not typically a mountain that many would consider to be extremely dangerous. While it is technical, many climbers with varying skill levels summit the peak each year. Yet in 2024, over a week, it would transform into one of the deadliest peaks. And Ethan Cannert was at the heart of one of those tragedies. Mount Whitney is the tallest mountain in the contiguous United States, standing at a whopping 14,505 feet. This giant is located in East Central California, right on the border between Inyo and Tulare counties. Part of the Sierra Nevada range, Mount Whitney is a favorite spot for hikers and climbers. It offers various routes, from easier paths to tough, challenging climbs. The level of danger can change each year based on weather conditions, the amount of snow and ice, and other environmental factors but there are plenty of signs and warnings spread throughout the peak. There are two main routes to climb Mount Whitney, the Mount Whitney Trail and the Mountaineer Route. Both start at the same place, the Whitney Postal Store. The Whitney Trail is 11 miles long one way and is a rather simple climb that thousands per year attempt. The Mountaineer Route, on the other hand, is over five miles long and has some of the most technical areas in all of the US, including the final 400, a steep 65 degree slope for 400 feet that ends near the summit. This is the route that experienced climbers take. Similar to all high altitude peaks, Mount Whitney has risks. Before you even start climbing, it's important to get used to the high altitude. Spending a few days at places above 9,000 feet can help your body adjust. This is called acclimatizing, and it can prevent serious problems like acute mountain sickness or AMS. AMS can make you feel dizzy, nauseous, or give you a headache. And if it gets worse, it can lead to more dangerous conditions like high altitude cerebral edema or high altitude pulmonary edema. If you start feeling sick, the best thing to do is to go back down to lower altitudes right away. The weather on Mount Whitney can also be very unpredictable. Even in the spring and summer, you might encounter snow and ice. It's essential to bring the right gear like crampons and ice axes and know how to use them. Obviously, other important items would be bringing the correct supplies such as lights, batteries, water, and food. But the most important item is knowing your limits. In May of 2024, Andrew Nizial and Patty Ballon were two climbers who wanted to attempt reaching the summit of Mount Whitney. Andrew, age 28, came from South Lake Tahoe. He was known for his deep appreciation of life, filled with climbing and adventure. Andrew regularly shared his experiences on social media, posting about his outdoor explorations. He was not an amateur climber. Andrew was very proud of the life he had built around his passion, and this passion he shared with Patty, who he thought was the most fun person he had ever met. Patty, who was 29 years old, had just finished her PhD at UC Davis. She loved the lifestyle Andrew lived, and soon after meeting him, they were joined by the hip. Patty was also a talented outdoor photographer, posting on Instagram and other official websites of their travels and experiences. In early May, Patty and Andrew had decided to travel to the Southern Sierra together, attempting to ski Mount Shasta, a well-known tall mountain in California. According to her Instagram post before their trip, Patty had recently completed a month-long 800-mile hike along the Arizona Trail. She also shared her adventures snowboarding in Lake Tahoe, running marathons, rock climbing, and hiking the Pacific Crest Trail. However, on May 3rd, while trying to climb Mount Shasta, they had to turn back before reaching the summit because the winds were just too strong. This would lead them to an even more dangerous route, the Mountaineer's Route on Mount Whitney. 
The trail includes a spot known as the Notch, which is a flat area where climbers can rest. The Mount Whitney Mountaineers route itself goes up a chute with an angle of 25 to 30 degrees and reaches the Notch at 14,100 feet. From there, the final push to the summit becomes even steeper, with an angle of more than 40 degrees. This last part of the climb requires technical climbing skills, the right equipment, and a high level of physical fitness. Now, you know it's bad when a region that relies on tourism tells you to stay away, but that's what ski resorts, local authorities, and the CHP are saying when it comes to visiting Tahoe this weekend. On May 3rd through the 5th, a winter storm hit the Sierra Nevada mountains, dropping more than a foot of snow at higher elevations, hence the reason for the duo to stop climbing Mount Shasta. On April 25th, Inyo County Search and Rescue warned that winter conditions still existed on Mount Whitney and that climbers should be very careful when trying to reach the top. The Inyo County Sheriff's Preventative Education Committee expressed concerns that the deadly accidents on Mount Baldy earlier this year might also happen on Mount Whitney this spring. Although Mount Whitney is a popular goal because it is not very technically difficult, it is still a challenging climb with serious risks, especially with the snow and ice that was expected to remain until at least late July this year. When the weather began to clear on May 5th, Patty and Andrew decided to climb and ski down Mount Whitney. They were confident in their abilities, but decided they still wanted help from someone who had a lot of experience, and they knew the perfect person to join them. Ethan Cannert was a friend of Patty and Andrew, and after he was asked to join the duo on the mountain, well, it didn't take long for him to say yes. So the trio would begin to prepare for their climb on May 6th, packing their supplies, snacks, and water. The trio planned a summit via the Mountaineer route, and on the way up the peak, they would leave their skis at an area called the Notch, just below the final 400. From there, they would ski back down to their camp at the upper Boy Scout Lake. Their route was planned, their supplies were prepared, and all they had to do was wait for the morning of May 7th. The trio would wake up as the sun was just coming over the horizon, reflecting off the rock and snow on the mountain. They would eat a quick breakfast, grab their supplies, and begin the trek at approximately 5 a.m. The climb is normally five hours long, and as the trio moved closer to the summit, everything was pretty normal. They were having a good time climbing the mountain, even reaching the final 400 ahead of schedule. They stashed their skis and began the final, most technical part of the climb. At approximately 10.15 a.m., the trio would eclipse the final ridge and summit the peak. They took a few minutes to soak in the view, catch their breath, and grab a quick snack. They stood on the summit for about 45 minutes before beginning their descent at 11 a.m. Ethan was honestly feeling great, and he decided to make the descent quickly, leaving Patty and Andrew as they were moving just a tad slower. So it was during the final 400 that Ethan picked up his pace and left the duo with a promise they would all meet up at the notch to finish their ski descent. Ethan would reach the notch and begin waiting for the duo, but Andrew and Patty didn't show up. Ethan would wait for over an hour before he was forced with the decision, leave his friends somewhere on the peak or continue to wait. Ethan would eventually decide to strap on his skis and begin the final part of the descent alone. He eventually returned to their camp at Upper Boy Scout Lake at 3.30 p.m. and contacted Search and Rescue. He said they both had cell service most of the way up the route, but neither responded to his messages. There was still no word from either of them when he sent the message. Ethan would also post in a Facebook private group that he had returned to their high camp at Upper Boy Scout Lake and descended from the summit plateau down the final 400, a very steep section of snow before Andrew and Patty. Search and rescue would begin combing the mountain, but as the hours passed, no answers were found. Then two days after the duo went missing on May 9th, the Inyo County Sheriff's Office would finally share that they had found the two missing climbers. Both were deceased. The details are still not confirmed, and they may never be, but it was assumed the duo had slipped and fallen somewhere on the final 400 because their bodies were reportedly found nearly a thousand feet lower than the notch. Unfortunately, this wasn't the only accident that would occur on Mount Whitney in early May. 
On May 12th, another climber, 26-year-old, Sahaj Singh Sagu, was attempting to climb the Mountaineer route. Sahaj was a local shop owner of Spears Market in Forestville and was described as being loved by his community. While attempting to climb the peak at approximately 9,600 feet, a rock fall would be started on the Ebersbacher ledges, a notorious part of the route that is famous for requiring hikers to use both their hands and feet to scramble up, making it inherently risky. In early spring, it becomes even more dangerous due to steep snow, loose rocks, and unpredictable weather. One of these rocks would strike Sahaj, causing serious injuries. He would never make it off the mountain. A helicopter crew from the California Highway Patrol lowered a search team member to the site and it was determined that the hiker had died from his injuries. Later on May 13th, the sheriff's office instructed people going to Mount Whitney that they should stick together go back if things got dangerous, make smart choices, and they will need to obtain permission to hike on the Mountaineer's route or the regular hiking trail any time of the year. From May 1st to November 1st, only a certain number of people are allowed in the area. I didn't think that I would be starting this climbing season off with a video about Mount Whitney, but here we are. Unfortunately, even the most mundane and simple peaks can take the most lives due to overconfidence and climbers being underprepared for their trek, but sometimes you can do all the right things and it just doesn't matter. But I guess that is just mountaineering. Thanks for watching. Until next time. Denali Park Rangers say three experienced climbers who recently made it to the summit of Denali sent out an SOS message to rangers after they became hypothermic and were unable to descend the mountain. As of tonight, two are still stuck after several attempts of the park helicopter pilot attempting to rescue them. On Thursday, May 30th, 2024, a climber stood at 19,600 feet on the upper slopes of Denali. The wind raged around him, whipping against his frostbitten face as he raised his arms above his head, waving at a helicopter struggling to stabilize above him. The climber was suffering from the early stages of hypothermia and had called for rescue two days prior. His climbing partner was in a snow cave just behind him, and if they had any chance to survive, they would need help. But the high winds and brutal temperatures had stopped any rescue from happening until Thursday evening. The problem was their rescue would not quite go as planned. Denali is the tallest mountain in North America, towering at 20,310 feet above sea level. Located in south central Alaska, it lies about 130 miles north northwest of Anchorage. Formed around 60 million years ago by tectonic uplift, Denali is the centerpiece of Denali National Park and Preserve. What makes Denali so difficult to climb is its location. The peak is infamous for having some of the most unpredictable weather in the world. One of the most famous quotes on the mountain is, there is no such thing as bad weather, only inappropriate clothing. Of course, the altitude, environment, and technical climbing also play a part in making North America's tallest peak an advanced climb. Nearly 1,000 climbers each year take on the peak through May and June, with 60 to 70 percent usually reaching the summit. But don't let the success rates fool you. Denali is a beast of a mountain. Since its first summit, at least 96 climbers have lost their lives on the peak, with a fatality rate of three climbers for every 1,000 summit attempts. There were 350 plus climbers on Denali's West Buttress route in May. The typical climb to the summit spans approximately three weeks, with most of that time acclimatizing to the high altitudes so that each climber's body can be prepared to make a summit push. Inadequate preparation can lead to high altitude sickness or a lack of oxygen from the thinner air, which can be fatal. The West Buttress Route is the most popular on Denali. It is a steady, gradual ascent with little vertical climbing. The route isn't considered highly technical, but the miles of glaciated terrain, extreme temperatures, hidden crevasses, and just time spent on the mountain increase the risk of accidents. A climber would normally fly into base camp and then begin the trek through the lower glacier to Camp 1 at about 7,800 feet. This is typically a five-mile walk while carrying approximately 100 
110 pounds of gear. Then you begin the trek to Camp 2 through the upper Cahiltna Glacier. The most dangerous part of this section is falling into a hidden crevasse that may be covered with snow. Then the real climb begins at Camp 3 at 11,200 feet, Camp 4 at 14,200 feet, and finally, High Camp at 17,200 feet. The final stretch to the summit is the most difficult, as you are climbing a steep slope to Denali Pass, then eventually, the summit. In late May, a team of three Malaysian climbers would take on Denali. Like the other expeditions on the mountain, they had been preparing to attempt a summit push for two weeks at this point, acclimatizing to the high altitudes. And there was news that late May could offer a small weather window where climbers would get the chance to summit. Zulkifli bin Yusuf was the youngest of the three, at 36 years old, with the other two climbers being a decade older. The trio was planning on making their final trip up the mountain over a few days in late May, with May 27th being their anticipated summit day. Their ascent up the mountain was pretty ordinary. The trio would begin in base camp, pass through the glacier, and start ascending via the various camps on the west buttress route. Like most mountaineering stories, nothing seems wrong until the very last moment. After reaching the high camp, the trio would take a short break to rest before beginning their final push to the summit. This is when the early signs of issues would begin. They were all exhausted from climbing at this point, but Yusuf's health in particular was declining rapidly. Don't get me wrong, he was still there and wanted to push for the summit, but it became obvious out of the three climbers, he was struggling the most. In the early hours of the morning on May 27th, the trio would begin their final trek from high camp up Denali Pass, then eventually across the football field. At some point during the early afternoon, the three climbers would reach the summit of North America's tallest peak, accomplishing the goal they had all set out to do months earlier. It was during their descent that they would begin to run into issues. Yusuf began suffering from high altitude sickness, and his body was beginning to fail. If he didn't get off the mountain soon, well, he didn't have very long. The issue was that he was also becoming delirious, making descending the mountain nearly impossible. Over the next several hours, the trio would labor down the slope, making their way towards high camp. But as the hours passed and eventually the sun set, they knew that they were in trouble. It wasn't just Yusuf who was struggling at this point. All three climbers were suffering from the beginning stages of hypothermia. It was in the late hours of May 27th when Yusuf collapsed, and the other two climbers knew they had no choice. They had to call for a rescue. The weather had continuously gotten worse over the last few hours, and the wind was whipping against their faces. They had only one option, to dig a snow cave to escape the wind. So they would pull out the small shovels they carried with them, and with the help of an experienced expedition guide who was also on the upper slopes, they began digging, eventually making a space wide enough for two people to be completely inside, away from the wind. Even though they had been descending for hours, the trio was at 19,600 feet, just 700 feet below the summit, on a flat area known as the football field. It was here at 1 a.m. on Tuesday, May 28th, that they sent an SOS message from a satellite device, stating they had summited Denali, but were hypothermic and unable to descend. Now it's not clear exactly what happened next, if there were some conversation or disagreement, but one of the climbers would eventually continue his descent, and he was able to make it back to high camp at 17,200 feet, where he was then rescued off the mountain. The other two climbers, however, were stuck in the cave at 19,600 feet. Yusuf's condition was only worsening by the hours, while his expedition partner tried to desperately care for him. As the weather began to slightly ease, the experienced guide who had helped them dig the cave would have to begin descending the mountain for his own safety, once again leaving the two climbers in the cave alone. Wednesday would come and pass, with the weather only worsening. At this point, the weather had gotten so bad that there was no other climbers on the upper slopes. Yusuf and his climbing partner were hanging by a thread. They had been above high camp for over two days at this point, and there was no end in sight. It wasn't until Thursday night that the wind began to let up enough for a helicopter to attempt to rescue. Now the wind was by no means gone. It was whipping the helicopter around, making it nearly impossible to fly. But the park rangers knew they didn't have very long if there was any chance to save the two climbers. As the pilot made his way up the slopes, he would spot a climber on the football field, standing outside a small hole, waving his arms above his head. It was a desperate final attempt to get the attention of the helicopter, and it worked. 
but the issue was, once again, the weather. The rangers quickly realized they would not be able to perform a rescue operation. Instead, they dropped a bag of supplies near the snow cave with the hope that they would survive another night. On Friday morning at 7 a.m., the weather would finally ease, and another rescue helicopter would make its second attempt at reaching the snow cave, and this time, they were successful. The chopper was able to relay a rescue basket to the climber outside the cave, and after he climbed in, they would fly down to 7,200 feet, where he would be transferred to the local hospital. It was noted that he was in surprisingly strong condition and was walking without help. After he reached safety, he would tell the rangers his climbing partner Yusuf had died in the snow cave two days prior, meaning Thursday night when they were delivering supplies, the surviving member would be huddled inside a snow cave with the body of his friend. That same night, rescue climbers would reach the snow cave on foot and bring down Yusuf's remains so that he could be reunited with his family. Yusuf was the second death on Denali in 2024, with another climber falling over a thousand meters to his death on Denali Pass just two weeks prior. Yusuf's climbing partners would make it off the mountain, and currently they are still recovering, with obviously a long road ahead of them. But they made it off Denali, and their friend didn't. On the morning of August 31st, 2023, the bright blue sky towered over two men as the sun greeted them on the steep, dangerous slopes of Gasher Brum 4. They were exhausted from the day before as they had climbed the icy walls and crossed deep cracks in the snow. The two men had made great progress and were excited about their climb, but as they got higher and higher, the weather started to change. Dark clouds once on the horizon were moving ever closer and the wind began to blow harder, whistling through the peaks. They clipped their ropes and started climbing, moving slowly and carefully. As they settled in for the night, the men were positioned on a narrow ledge with the tent struggling to stay upright, protecting them from the deep, dangerous drop below. If there's a mountain that's tougher to climb than K2, it's Gasher Brum 4. It stands at 7,925 meters, making it close to the ever-exclusive 8,000 meter mark. It is known for its steep rock walls that never seem to end, which create a tough technical climb that only experienced and advanced mountaineers can even attempt. It's situated in the Gilgit Balkistan region in Pakistan, where the weather can be unpredictable. Since 2024, only 17 people have reached the summit in the mountain's history, proving the difficulty but also making it one of the most alluring peaks today for extreme climbers. When you first approach the Baltoro region, many towering mountains obscure your view, but typically one will spot Gasherbrum 4 first. Nearby are five other peaks, with Gasherbrum 1, 2, and 3 slightly taller at 8,068 meters, 8,032 meters, and 7,952 meters respectively. Gasherbrum 4 itself ranks as the 17th highest mountain in the world. It sits right where the Baltoro Glacier split casting a huge shadow over everything below it. There are two main routes climbers use to tackle Gasherbrum 4. One starts from the Baltoro Glacier at a lower altitude, while the other begins from the vast glacier fields near Camp 1 of Gasherbrum 1, 2, and 3. On either route, you will be forced to traverse large crevasses, long ice wall climbs, and high avalanche prone areas. Dmitry Golovchenko was a highly respected Russian figure in the world of mountaineering, known for his alpine style, bold and swift approach to climbing. He became a member of the Dimchenka Alpine Club in 2001, renowned for its ethos of fast and fearless alpinism. Golovchenko's skill and achievements were widely acknowledged, both in Russia and globally. Among his notable feats was the pioneering ascent of the northwest wall of the Nameless Tower and the Karakorum region, where he, alongside Sergei Nilov, Viktor Volodin, and Alexander Yurkin, established the route No Fear. Even the name sends shivers down my spine as the pictures show the route to be a near vertical climb the entire way. This marked one of his significant contributions to the sport. In 2013, Golovchenko received his first Pila Dior, the most prestigious award in mountaineering one can achieve. 
for the first ascent of the northeast spur of Mustok Tower via Think Twice, accomplished with Sergei Nilov and Alexander Lang. This achievement underscored his prowess in tackling challenging climbs in high altitude environments and his ability to discover new routes. Continuing his impressive career in 2015, Golovchenko was part of a team that accomplished the route Ninth Wave on Sedoi Straw's East Buttress in the Chinese Tian Shan, which stands as a vertical 5,811 meter rock wall, only further impressing his colleagues and highlighting the advanced skills Golovchenko possessed. A pinnacle moment came in 2017 when Golovchenko, along with Sergei Nilov and Dmitry Grigorev, successfully ascended Thale Sagar's formidable North Face via Movable Feast, earning him his second Pila Dior, elevating his status once again and putting him in elite mountaineering company. Only 16 other climbers in the history of the sport have more than one Pila Dior. Golovchenko's contributions were not only celebrated internationally, but also recognized locally with his four-time recipient of the Russian Golden Axe Award. He was a man that could not live life without a challenge, and his next one would be his biggest task yet, Gasherbrum 4. To add to the challenge, Golovchenko would not settle on just climbing the mountain. He wanted to do it his way, through an unclimbed route the unknown Southeast Ridge. This caught the attention of mountaineers from all over the globe as they began following his preparations. Joined by his climbing partner, Sergei Nilov, the pair had never attempted a mountain so high before. The two men's expertise was with large wall climbing, but despite the 7,925 meter frame, is for the most part a giant wall of rock and ice. So it made perfect sense for these two men to set their sights on this peak. However, just getting to the mountain over the icy, cracked-filled glacier was not easy and proved to be the first challenge. There were many hidden crevasses and the cold wind bit at any exposed skin. After a few acclimation trips, they started climbing on August 21st. The weather forecasts weren't great, but they did not have a lot of options, so the men took the first opportunity they could get. In order to reach the summit, they planned for about two weeks of climbing. The mountain in the morning was covered in a thick fog, but this would clear on their first day. They had to battle the strong winds and ice hung from their eyelids, only highlighting the extreme temperatures. Occasionally, there would be a slight snowfall, but nothing too worrisome. Despite these tough conditions, they kept going, and for the next 10 days, they made a lot of progress. The day of August 31st was no different. The two men began their climb and were enjoying themselves. The day progressed like the previous, as they made their way higher up the mountain. Everything seemed to be going as planned until late in the afternoon, when a dark stormed cloud on the horizon began approaching the men. They looked at each other and not a word had to be said. They both knew it would be a long night. They had been climbing slowly in the afternoon due to the increasingly bad weather, reaching 7,684 meters, only 250 meters below the summit. As the sun began to set, they had to make shelter, but there was a problem. There was no flat location around them to even pitch a tent. So instead, the men found a small snow ledge and then began packing snow onto it in an attempt to make it big enough for their resting location. Eventually, the men succeeded in setting up their small shelter for the night, and once satisfied, the men went inside to rest. Some time had passed when all of a sudden, both men felt the tent move. It was not enough to be alarmed, but just enough for Sergei to step outside and investigate. So he did step outside and began looking around when all of a sudden he heard Golovchenko shout, Sergei, I am falling. Sergei watched helplessly as the tent with Golovchenko and their belongings slid down the slope and plummeted down a steep, icy channel. All that remained where the tent had been was a safety rope. Alone and exposed, Sergei spent the rest of the night without shelter battling the harsh conditions. By morning, the storm would die as he descended an intense and impressive 15 stages of repels to reach the spot where Golovchenko had fallen. There, he carefully wrapped his fallen friend in the tent before beginning the journey back alone. It took him over five long days to navigate treacherous terrain back to base camp, surviving without gas or food. Every day, Sergei had to decide to keep going or to give up. 
Being alone in snowy conditions under freezing temperatures and brutal winds, along the way he sought refuge in snow caves bundled in two sleeping bags for warmth. Eventually, he would make it back safely and recount his expedition to all those that would listen, as his survival story is a miracle. Despite Sergei making it back safe, Dmitri ultimately lost his life on Gasher Brum 4. Being one of the most skilled climbers in our generation, Dmitri died doing what he loved. He was a man who could not sit by and let the world pass him. He always needed a challenge, and for him, that was mountaineering. His career is one of the most impressive in recent times, and it's no understatement to say the mountaineering community truly lost a legend. Thanks for watching. Until next time. There have already been several accidents in 2024 on Mount Everest, but are any of us surprised to hear that? What you see on screen are photos and videos from the climbing season on the world's tallest mountain. I am serious, this is real footage, and I promise if you stick around later in this video, there will be a specific ominous video taken near the summit that you do not want to miss. But why? Why is it, year after year, that record number of deaths occur on the mountain? Some chalk it up to the ever-increasing number of climbers, lack of regulation, or the amateur companies leading expeditions. Today, we will dive into it all, but most importantly, tell the story of Daniel Patterson and his Nepali guide, Pastinji Sherpa. By all accounts, these two men should have reached the summit and made it off the mountain without incident. They were experienced extremely fit in climbing for all the right reasons. But this is Mount Everest. The one thing we know by now is to expect the unexpected. The 2024 climbing season on Mount Everest is coming to a close this week, and there are several stories we will be covering on this channel, but first, would you be surprised if I told you that there were fewer permits on the peak than last year? Maybe we are learning after 2023 was the deadliest climbing season in history. In 2024, there were 421 permits issued to climbers, versus 478 permits issued in 2023. 2024 was still the second busiest year in the mountain's history so I don't think we have suddenly made a big change. The reason this is relevant is the direct correlation between the number of climbers on the peak during the season to deaths on the mountain. The more climbers, the more chances something could go wrong. But this isn't really what concerns those who take on the slopes. What is concerning is the long queues, especially higher up on the mountain. The higher you climb, the thinner the air gets, and above 8,000 meters, the oxygen level is a third of what it is at sea level, meaning even the simplest of tasks, like walking up at a slight angle, are inherently more difficult. Combine this with waiting for hours in line to the summit, well, this is why people are worried about the number of climbers, and we haven't even talked about the trash and waste that climbers are leaving behind. However, in recent years, there have been initiatives to clean up Everest, such as the mountain cleanup campaign in Nepal. They are fighting a losing battle without some regulation from the government. What these long lines to the summit do is make it easier for amateur climbers to complete their dream of summiting the tallest peak, because most of the expeditions are taking the same route through the dangerous Kumbu Icefall and nearly the same route to the summit, this has allowed expedition companies to provide fewer guides versus clientele. A few years ago, it was common to see one guide for every three to four climbers, and while this is still the stated industry standard, the truth is, we are moving away from this. The primary reason is that a guide is simply a babysitter at this point, and of course, one more reason money. Nepali relies on the money brought in through the Everest climbing season. It is the biggest supplier to their economy and how much of the country's population survives. In 2024, the country is estimated to have brought in 4.5 million in permit revenue alone. Then, all the western climbers pay for Sherpas and porters to carry their gear to base camp and eventually help them summit. Let's not kid ourselves. Nepal has an inherent interest in allowing permits to the mountain because it helps not only the local economy, but also the country. So what do you get when you have greed, amateur climbers, fewer guides, and overcrowding? Well, you get more deaths and debris than we have ever seen. I wish I had a solution, and honestly, I'm not sure I'm qualified to give an opinion on how things should change. But one thing is inherently clear to me. Everest has a problem, and it doesn't seem to be going away 
anytime soon. In 2024, Daniel Patterson lost someone important to him. Daniel, known by his friends as Dan, was a 39-year-old from Wakefield, England. He was the co-owner of Wakefield CrossFit and had decided to climb Mount Everest to help raise money for the family of a gym member who had recently died from cancer. Dan was in great shape. By all accounts, the physical demand of climbing Everest would not be a problem for him, but he would have to get over the lack of experience. I don't mean that Dan didn't have experience climbing, he certainly did, and had summited Island Peak and arguably a more technical climb, Amadablam, in preparation for Everest. But this was his first time on the world's tallest peak. So he enlisted the help of 8K Expeditions, one of the most popular expedition companies in the Karakoram range. This is where Dan would meet his Sherpa, Pastinji. While Dan was known for his robust fitness, uplifting positivity, and strong determination, Pastinji Sherpa had already summited Everest twice, along with reaching the top of K2, Amadablam, and dozens of other 6,000 meter mountains. Oh, and he had done all of this before the age of 23. While young, Pastinji Sherpa was extremely experienced as he had been climbing his entire life. The 2024 season would start in late April, and on the first day, the mountain would fight the entire time. It was noted that the Kumbu Icefall, the most dangerous part of the peak, was even more difficult to navigate this year. The reason the icefall is so dangerous is because it is constantly shifting. It is typically traversed early in the morning when the ice is compact and solid, and it's not uncommon to see falling seracs or avalanches pass through the icefall. What makes this so dangerous is the amount of time you have to cross it. Typically, climbers will acclimatize on the mountain before making a summit push. This is when climbers will traverse to a certain altitude before returning to base camp, not only to familiarize themselves with the route, but their bodies as well. If a climber is adequately prepared, their chances of success greatly increase. But this means they have to pass through the Kumbu Icefall several times. For a normal climber, this usually equates to six to eight times per season. But Sherpas, well, they can traverse the icefall anywhere from 30 to 40 times. Incidents in 2023 and 2014 are why the icefall has been called a tomb for the Sherpas. But all climbers know the risks, and in 2024, the icefall was no different. It was stated as taking up to 10 hours to navigate this year, with the description of constantly changing directions, making it one of the more challenging routes in recent years. There are many reasons why this is done, but 2014 plays a big part in how the route is chosen. If you want to know more about this particular area of the mountain, I have an entire video about that event, and I'll post it down below in case you are interested. Not much is public about the exact acclimatization rotation or trip for Dan and Pastinji Sherpa, but we do know they would be traversing the South Col. This is the primary route climbers take on Everest post-2020 COVID because China still has not opened the more technical north route. A typical Everest expedition takes approximately three weeks before climbers are even thinking about taking on the upper slopes. This usually equates to seven to 11 days of traveling and hiking to Everest's base camp, then another two weeks of acclimatization trips, whether that be on Everest or nearby peaks such as Lhotse. Then, when the weather begins to clear, typically in mid-May, there is a rush to the summit. Some years, this weather window can be as short as a few days, and other years, it can be a couple of weeks. This is why there are long lines to the summit. Most expeditions will have planned to summit the peak within the same two to five day period. 8K expeditions were no different and Dan and Pastinji Sherpa would begin their bid up the mountain in mid-May. After completing the difficult Kumbu Icefall, they would have rested in Camp 1 before continuing up the mountain. While Camp 1 to Camp 4 can be dangerous, this is considered the easiest part of the trek. Dan and Pastinji Sherpa would reach Camp 4 on May 19th, and it was crowded. May 20th would be another summit day for many expeditions, and Dan and Pastinji Sherpa would be right in the middle of the long lines. Summit day starts early, 
typically around 1 to 3 a.m. This is so that climbers can reach the summit by late morning. One of the most important rules on the mountain is the 2 o'clock rule. This means that if you cannot reach the summit by 2 p.m., you should turn around because summoning after 2 p.m. means that you will be descending the peak in the dark. The descent is always more dangerous than the climb up because the adrenaline is gone, exhaustion is setting in, and your body is beginning to shut down from the lack of oxygen. That is why the area above 8,000 meters is the death zone. No life can sustain itself for a long period. On summit day, Dan and Pastinji Sherpa would wake up early, grab a quick breakfast, and begin the trek to the summit. Their headlamps would bounce off the snow as they walked, and there were dozens of lights in front of them. From this point to the summit, they would be fighting against other climbers. The duo would have supplemental oxygen tanks hanging from their belts, rattling as they walked. Their faces were covered with their masks, providing their only source of energy for the next 20 hours. They were mentally preparing themselves for one of the most difficult sections on the mountain, the Hillary Step. The Hillary Step is the last challenge for climbers on the South Call route. It is a nearly vertical rock face with a height of about 12 meters located at 8,790 meters above sea level. As climbers navigate the narrow ridge, there is a 3,000 meter drop on the right side and a 2,400 meter drop on the left. Thankfully, during peak climbing season, the Hillary Step is covered in snow, making it easier to traverse. But it is not uncommon for climbers to see bodies of other fallen climbers as they traverse this section. Nothing was exciting about Dan and Pastinji Sherpa's bid to the summit. They walked in line, taking small steps when it was their turn to move, slowly making progress. They traversed the slopes, then the Hillary Step, and the final push to the summit, before standing on top of the world. But all climbers know this is only half the battle. After reaching the summit, they would take a moment to document their achievement, then begin fighting the crowds back down to the Hillary Step. As they were fighting the ongoing traffic both ways, Dan and Pastinji Sherpa began traversing the narrow ridge. As they moved, they would constantly be detaching and reattaching their harness onto the guide rope along the ridge. This was a last ditch effort to protect climbers from falling and had been set up by the first Sherpas who trailblazed their way to the summit. At 4.40 a.m. on May 21st, 2024, they moved through the Hillary Step and everything was normal. Then, wasn't. One second, Dan and Pastinji Sherpa were making their way along the narrow ridge, and the next, the ridge was gone. It happened so fast that few climbers even comprehended what was going on. The thick snow known as a cornice had fallen under the pressure of all the footsteps, and under the snow was a sheer drop thousands of meters down the north side of Everest, the side of the mountain that was regulated by China and closed for the season, meaning there was no trail or climbers on this side of the peak. Earlier, I mentioned an ominous video from this season. Four climbers would fall in the collapse, and two of those climbers would make their way back up the Hillary Step, still attached to the guide rope. This video shows one of those climbers, but two climbers were missing, Dan and Pastinji Sherpa. Search efforts would begin, but it was slow, and honestly, it was extremely difficult because the north side of the mountain was untraversed in 2024. Another Sherpa in base camp would describe the search, it is going to be difficult to search for them because they have fallen on the Tibet side, which needs coordination. To make matters worse, the Everest season was expected to only last a few more days. It is now early June, and rescue efforts have been unable to locate Dan or Pastinji Sherpa. Dan's partner, Bex, would start a GoFundMe to raise funds to search for him, and as of the recording of this video, she has raised £126,000 out of the £150,000 goal. She states the funds would be used for helicopter flights and aerial searches, along with specialized equipment, communication, and logistics support, but the most recent update stated that because of his location, nobody was able to assist in the search or rescue for Dan. Today, Dan and Pastinji Sherpa are still listed as missing, but almost everyone knows that the duo couldn't have survived the fall. While some may blame the traffic on Everest, I honestly believe that what happened was an accident. An accident that shouldn't have happened. This isn't a case of amateur climbers or an expedition not being prepared, but simply 
the mountain fighting back. The reality is that Everest is going to continue to have more climbers on the mountain each year, and each year we are going to see the death toll rise. There is a direct interest for Nepal to continue issuing permits, and there are more people than ever trying to climb Everest. Potentially, China will reopen the north side of the mountain, and that may help with traffic on one side, but most amateur climbers are still going to traverse the less technical south route. So, what do we do? There is overcrowding, waste issues, fewer guides to clients, and millions of dollars being thrown around. I think the better question is should we do anything? I do believe that taking care of the mountain is the most important factor here, but who am I to stop people from attempting a lifelong goal, just as long as they know the risks? I hope you all enjoyed. Until next time. Mountaineering, a pursuit of reaching the highest points on Earth, has always been associated with the spirit of exploration and the challenge of human limits. However, the increasing popularity of high altitude climbing has brought to light a pressing issue, overcrowding on mountains. This issue is not only altering the essence of mountaineering, but also raising serious ethical questions, especially when tragedies occur, as seen on K2. In recent years, K2, the world's second highest peak, has seen a surge in the number of climbers attempting to reach its summit. Reports from the 2022 climbing season describe scenes of conga lines at the infamous bottleneck Kular, with over 100 climbers reaching the summit on a single day. The year 2022 marked a record with 207 permits issued, and estimates for 2024 suggest around 200 to 250 permits. Such numbers are staggering when compared to the mountain's history, where in previous years, only a few dozen might attempt the summit. As more and more people crowd onto mountains like K2, tragic accidents occur more frequently, and among these tragedies is that of Ali Akbar Saki. Ali Akbar Saki was a passionate and ambitious mountaineer from Afghanistan, known for his remarkable achievements in high altitude climbing. Born in the Doshi district of Baglan province, Saki had an outstanding track record in mountaineering, which included successfully reaching Na Shak Peak, the highest mountain in Afghanistan, after a challenging 17-day ascent. By the age of 36, Saki had climbed several high altitude peaks, but his aspirations led him to set his sights on even more formidable mountains. The start of the 2022 climbing season was highly anticipated and an exciting time. The world was just getting out of a two-year pandemic where most global travel was highly restricted. This led to many expeditions fighting over the small spaces on any 8000er and K2 was no different. On July 20th, 2022, a lot was happening on the Abruzzi Spur route. The mountain is notorious for being one of the most difficult 8,000 meter peaks to climb. The shoulder where Camp 3 is located was extremely busy. Even though the wind was strong and the weather looked bad, the forecast predicted things would get better soon. Many Sherpas were on their way up to the tippity top and tons of climbers flowing were trekking camps three and four. All were hoping for nicer weather in the coming days. Saki was one of those climbers. He had joined a group called Karakoram Expeditions led by Mizra Ali. According to his wife, Saki had spent a lot of money to be there, about 40,000 US dollars. That money covered three oxygen bottles for the last push to the summit, got him a guide to help him along the way, and most importantly, a spot on the mountain. Saki was helped by a guide named Dalit Muhammad. Even though Saki had experience with tall mountains before, he did not want to cut costs and desired an experienced Sherpa with him for his climb. However, this would not be the case as Muhammad had never been on K2 before and there was simply nobody else to help. Saki had been moving slowly during his acclimatization climbs. But what was more worrisome is that since the beginning of the expedition, he had developed a cough that would not go away. Many others noticed how slow his practice climbs were, and some remarks were made that Saki was not in the correct condition to climb. Despite this, he insisted on joining the final push to the summit as he felt up for the task. On the morning of July 20th, before leaving Camp 2, Saki sent a message to his wife saying he felt good, but as he made his way to Camp 3, something went wrong. At 10.35 a.m., Saki recorded a video on his phone while they waited for supplies. 
He said they were above camp too, and his climbing buddy's suit had ripped, which was causing their delay. However, Saki continued to be very slow after leaving camp too, so slow in fact, that Muhammad would suggest they go back to camp too. But Saki did not accept this, and wanted to keep going. In another video from Saki's phone, he said that climbing K2 isn't easy, especially with a porter who's never been there before. Saki explained that because the porter didn't know the timing well, they had got stuck in a storm, and they were doing their best to get out of the tough situation and praying to God for help. <laughs> But as time passed, no help would come. The weather kept getting worse as the sun set below the sky. They were approximately 7,050 meters high up on K2, surrounded by howling winds as a fierce blizzard screamed around them. Saki was struggling to move and didn't want to go back down, but Muhammad saw no other option. The storm made everything worse. Saki became so exhausted from the climb and weather that he couldn't move up or down anymore. Saki and his guide sat on a ledge, facing the harsh blizzard as snow whirled around them. Saki's cough, which had been there since the start, was getting worse, possibly indicating high altitude sickness. While coughing is normal in the dry mountain air, Saki's cough was unrelenting, which was never a good sign. While stuck under the deadly conditions and alone with one's thoughts, Saki revealed to his guide for the first time that he had heart issues. This is not something that you should keep to yourself when trying to climb an 8000er. As the hours passed, their health deteriorated and the weather worsened. Saki's guide decided he could no longer sit there and set out to Camp 3 to seek help. Due to the harsh conditions, there was no visibility on the mountain as Muhammad traversed multiple feet of snow, eventually reaching to Camp 3. At Camp 3, Karakoram Expeditions had assembled a big team, including a group of porters assisting Samina Beg in her quest to reach the summit. Samina, the sister of Mirza Ali, the owner of Karakoram Expeditions, was on her third attempt to conquer K2. She was determined to make history as the first Pakistani woman to reach its summit. That evening, everyone in the team knew that Saki hadn't made it to Camp 3. Michael Pfeiffer from Denmark, a member of the team, shared on Facebook that the last climber hadn't arrived at Camp 3. Due to harsh weather, a proper search couldn't be conducted. So they spent the night crammed into crowded tents, battling extreme winds with little sleep. The strong wind and bad weather would not last all night as there was a break around 11 p.m. The eerie, quiet night was a stark contrast to mere hours before. On the morning of July 21st, the weather was perfect. While most of the expedition team kept climbing to the top, two porters descended from Camp 3. However, they weren't going to look for Saki. Instead, they were tasked with helping another climber, Michael Pfeiffer. Michael, alone with two high-altitude porters, began their descent from Camp 3 at around 7 a.m. They had decided to not go for the summit as one of the high-altitude porters was a strong climber but was showing signs of altitude sickness. As they descended the mountain, they did not expect to find anyone, but after 30 minutes into their climb, they came across Saki. Despite spending the night out in the harsh weather, surrounded by snow at about 7,150 meters, he was still alive. Saki, unfamiliar with the landscape of K2, didn't know Camp 3 was nearby. Word of his location was given to base camp and then spread to the various camps on the mountain. As per the Karakoram Expedition's report, Arshad, the most senior guy, and Dalit descended to help Saki, while other team members arrived a bit earlier and provided him with water, cheese, and chocolate. Surprisingly, he seemed to be okay. The day progressed slowly as the men tried to make Saki more comfortable, but would note that he kept making comments about his heart. But after Saki began to recover, they were faced with another problem, the actual climbing route on K2. Pfeiffer's main worry was getting Saki down the Black Pyramid, a deadly traverse. Saki said he could do it, but Pfeiffer doubted him. The men, with no other option left, began preparing Saki for the traverse. With artificial oxygen, the two high-altitude portals struggled to move him very far. After about 50 meters of climbing, Saki collapsed on the rope, unresponsive. Sadly, 
he had collapsed and passed away from heart failure. Additional climbers arrived at this moment to help out, but they were too late. There was nothing more that anyone could do, and even less could be said. Saki had managed to get through the steep parts of the Black Pyramid and had reached the last steep area with soft snow above. Pfeiffer confirmed they were very close to Camp 3 before Saki collapsed. If they had made it to Camp 3, then it's possible the supplies, oxygen, and medication could have helped him. But nobody will ever know for certain. While Samina and most of the Karakorum expedition team continued to Camp 4, Samina reached the summit on the morning of July 22nd joining around 145 other climbers who achieved the feat that day. She was accompanied by six high-altitude porters. On their descent to base camp, they passed the body of Ali Akbar Saki. Another climber admitted that Saki's body was near the fixed ropes, visible to everyone descending from Camp 3 and being passed by on their own journeys. Nala Kiani, who was climbing K2 for the first time after summoning her first 8,000 meter peak, Gasherbrum 2 in 2021, had faced a tragic loss before the expedition. Her climbing teacher and mentor, Ali Raza, who was supposed to guide her on K2, had died in a rock climbing accident just weeks before. In shock, Kiani ended up climbing with Sirbaz Khan. Khan, who was focused on completing the 14 8,000 meter peaks, hadn't initially planned to climb K2 that year. However, he decided to go as a tribute to Raza, who had mentored him. On July 21st, while on their way to Camp 3, with a large group of climbers, they spotted Saki lying on the snow. He had collapsed right in front of Khan, who was climbing about 30 minutes ahead. As Kiani approached, she zoomed in with her phone to see what was happening. She noticed a small Afghani flag falling towards her, which she grabbed, realizing it belonged to Saki. Kiani recorded the video at 11 a.m., so she estimates Khan met Saki around 10.30 a.m. when Saki was at approximately 7,100 meters. According to Michael Pfeiffer's report, they found Saki 50 vertical meters higher, indicating he had managed to walk down another 50 meters before collapsing. Kiani admits that when Khan reached Saki, he became very emotional. He wanted to perform CPR, hoping Saki was still alive. But Kiani's climbing group included Dr. Richard Cartier, who checked Saki and confirmed that there was nothing more they could do. According to Kiani, Khan and Arshad performed the last rites for Saki, praying, closing his eyes, and covering his head with the hood of his down suit. They took charge of moving Saki's body down the mountain because the two porters who had come down from Camp 3 were overwhelmed. Kiani said that Khan moved Saki's body for over two hours to 7,000 meters and secured it to a rock. Kiani and Khan later continued their climb and summited Gasherbrum 1. However, Kiani hasn't been able to forget the traumatic experience on K2. She posted a solemn report on her Instagram, including her team's role in helping to remove Saki's body from the route. Ali Akbar Saki was striving to become the first Afghan climber to summit an 8,000 meter peak. He also aimed to promote Afghanistan's Hindu Kush mountains. As a successful entrepreneur and IT consultant, he was actively involved in charity work. He was well liked at base camp, with one climber saying basically everybody liked him. The reports raised some questions about Saki's condition, the guide's abilities, and an overcrowding issue with inexperienced climbers on the peak. But the most pressing question left unanswered is why. With a large support team waiting at Camp 3, no one was able to help Saki. Instead, he was left exposed in the open throughout the entire night. Similarly, in July 2023, Muhammad Hassan, a 27-year-old Pakistani porter, fell while setting up ropes for climbers. A video surfaced showing climbers stepping over Hassan as he lay dying. In fact, I did a video at the time covering his entire story. The deaths of Saki and Hassan underscore a troubling trend, the abandonment of climbers in distress. The drive to reach the summit, coupled with the sheer number of climbers, can lead to a depersonalization of the risks involved. When every climber is focused on their own goal, the spirit of camaraderie and mutual assistance that has long been a hallmark of mountaineering can be lost. The question of blame in the wake of a climber's death on K2 
it's complex. While individual decisions play a role, there is a collective responsibility within the mountaineering community to address the underlying issues of overcrowding and its consequences. It is imperative to find a balance between the desire for adventure and the preservation of the mountains and the safety of all those who climb them.